Thank you. Uh, I can never resist coming and speaking at an event named after a formula, being a mathematician. So, um, and actually, I calculated this is my fifth 5 by 15. So I'm up to 5 by 5 by 15. So um, that's uh, even uh, more exciting. So uh, when I'm at a party and somebody asks me, um, so what do you do? Um, I kind of look forward and slightly dread this question. Uh, because when I say, oh, I'm a mathematician, um, generally this kind of look of horror appears on the person's face and they start backing away and their glass gets very empty and they dash to the bar and uh, actually before they go they always seem to tell me what they got in their GCSC or O level which I'm not really sure what that's about um, the few people that stick around one of the things they often say to me is wow surely you're the first to get put out of a job um, by all of these computers that are appearing on the scene. And I got this especially in the 90s um, when uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at the game of chess because chess has always been something that people have compared to doing mathematics. It's quite logical, uh, sort of logical moves. And, um, uh, but actually, there was always another game that I held up as my kind of protective shield against those who said, well, if, if, a, if a computer can play chess, then surely it can do mathematics. And that's a game called the Game of Go. It's an ancient game from China, Korea, Japan, played on a 19 by 19 grid, and you put black and white stones down. And this game, um, it's a game still of logic, but actually to play this game, you need a lot of creativity, kind of intuition. You're quite sure why you're making moves. Um, it gets more and more complex as the ball gets filled. Um, and you have to go have a sense of the patterns that are emerging. Quite hard to articulate why you're making certain moves. Um, so this was always my protective shield because people said AI will get nowhere near being able to play this game because it's so difficult to kind of logically code up. Um, but then I went through an existential crisis a couple of years ago because um, DeepMind here in London uh, designed this new code uh, called AlphaGo and they challenge uh, the world's greatest Go player, Lee Sedol in Korea. Um, and we're going through a real revolution in algorithms and code and AI at the moment. Because in the past, things had to be perfect. They had to be coded from the top down, and you couldn't have a bug in it. Now we've changed, and now code doesn't have to be perfect, interestingly enough. Code learns by making its mistakes. The best way to learn is to make mistakes. And what this code does, it's kind of got a meta code. It's a machine learning code where by being exposed to data and in the environment, it makes a mistake and realizes, well, what did I need to have done in order to have got that right last time? And it corrects itself. So this AlphaGo, it trained on all the human games on the internet, um, learnt how we play, and then it just started playing itself. And whenever one sort of version of itself lost, it analysed, well, what was the thing I did wrong there? Um, and, and so it built up strength after strength. It still wasn't clear it was going to beat Lee Sedol, but it completely trashed him. But for me, what was really frightening wasn't just playing the game well. It was playing the game in a completely new, shocking, creative way. There was one moment in game two, it was a five-match game, uh, when Lisa Doyle got up onto the hotel uh, to have a fag. Um, computers don't need cigarettes to stimulate themselves. Um, and this uh, AlphaGo suggested a move. Um, early on in the game, you play kind of on the edges of the board. Um, you play on lines th three and four in from the edge. Suddenly, AlphaGo suggested in move 37 to put a stone on the fifth line here, this little uh, black uh, stone with a white dot in it. The commentators, I watched this online on YouTube um, uh, uh, obsessively, um, the commentators at the time said, wow, AlphaGo's made a classic mistake. You do this, your Go master slaps you on the wrist and says, you don't play that far in early on in the game. And everyone said, Lisa Doll should be able to win this game because it made a mistake. Turned out this was not a mistake. Deep into the game, very late on, the, the stones started building up towards this part of the board. That move won AlphaGo the game there. This shocked everyone. And in fact, this has taught us a new way to play the game. And I think this is what's so exciting. For me, this is classified as a creative move. 
I spent some time with Margaret Bowdon on a committee at the Royal Society looking at the impact of machine learning and the new AI, this AI that seems to be able to learn from its mistakes on society. And she told me this nice definition she uses for creativity. It should be something which is new. Well, it's easy to make new things. It's easy for a computer to make new things. But the second two things are that it should be surprising and it should have value. Surprise and value are, of course, both quite subjective and um, uh, human sort of responses. But in this case, this move certainly was new. It surprised the commentators, and it had value because it won AlphaGo that game. So I began to get very unnerved. I call mathematics a highly creative subject, which I thought no computer would be able to get anywhere near doing what I do as a mathematician. Yet suddenly I saw this game, the computer being not only to win it, but being creative. And in fact, it started to teach us a new way to play the game. Uh, the way we played the game, we were sort of at a, at a peak. We, we had a kind of optimal way to play the game. What AlphaGo showed us was this peak isn't the highest peak in the land. There's another much higher peak if you go down and play moves that you were told not to by your Go master. You can actually play the game at a much um, uh, higher level. So this our AI is now teaching us as humans to play the game in a new way, which I think is, is really exciting. And for me, the journey that I've been on in this book, The Creativity Code, is looking at how AI can help us as humans maybe to be more creative. And so I've looked at the impact it's had on my world of mathematics, but I thought I would look more broadly at the things that we regard as uniquely human, creating art, paintings, music, writing novels. We all thought that was something not, AI could never get anywhere near because it's all about expressing one's own humanity. So I was intrigued. If this AI can learn um, on the data that we've had to date, could it take the data of the great paintings we've painted, the music we've composed, the novels we've written, and could it learn the sort of things that surprise us and give us excitement when we, we are exposed to them? So I've looked at a whole load of the arts, but I thought for you tonight, I would look at just the visual arts. Um, and so one of the interesting stories I tell is how they took um, data from a, a very famous painter, Rembrandt, and there's a lot of Rembrandt portraits, and this machine learning learned on the style that he sort of developed, his use of light, the sort of proportions he likes, the way he, he uh, paints a portrait. And what they did was to, to learn those kind of tricks that he used uh, to try and produce one more Rembrandt from beyond the grave. Now, one way you could do this is you could take all the portraits and kind of average them. But this doesn't work. Um, actually, as Francis Galton, um, uh, the eugenics guy, he thought he could get a picture of what a classic criminal looks like. So he lots, took lots of photographs of criminals, all with kind of disfigured faces and things like this. And he, what he did is just laid them on top of each other and took an average. What he was surprised was, if you take an average, you get an incredibly beautiful face appearing out of that. Um, so you can't do that. You have to do something cleverer. And this is what they produced. One of these is a real Rembrandt, and one of these is a, a, an AI Rembrandt. Now, what I want you to do is to think, which of these, are, how good are you at picking up um, something definitely human, and the soul coming through, and something that has no soul to it at all? So I'm going to take a vote with you. Um, so let's take uh, the Rembrandt on the left. Put your hands up if you think this is an AI Rembrandt. Okay, good. And now put your hands up if you think uh, the one on the right is the AI Rembrandt. Well, lots more going for the one on the right. Um, uh, so uh, you'll be shocked to learn that, in fact, the one on the left is the AI Rembrandt. Um, and, and I think it's doing a pretty, so that was pretty, it was fairly split, I, I think, there. But um, I, I think certainly it's of the style. Um, but a, a Rembrandt expert came along. And interestingly, they did this not just as a flat print. They 3D printed it, because Rembrandt has a very rich kind of uh, uh, 3D topographic style that he paints with his uh, oils. And they 3D printed this. The Rembrandt expert came along and said, well, it's kind of a texture of you know, 20 years before the actual port. So if they're criticizing it on that kind of level, you realize they've done a good job. OK, but what's the point about creating a new Rembrandt? We have wonderful Rembrandts. There's really no point in using AI to do that. What's exciting is to use AI to do something new. 
So here's, oh yeah, sorry, Jonathan Jones. I love Jonathan Jones. He's my favorite art critic. Uh, this is his comment on this Rembrandt project. He said, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature when technology is used for things it should never be used for. Um, but anyone who wears shirts like that, I really don't <laughs> trust on their kind of artistic... Um, but as I said, I think he's right. It shouldn't be used for that. It should be used for pushing us into new realms. And here are four paintings. Uh, four of them are done by uh, artists uh, who were showing their work at Basel Art Fair last year. Four of them are done by an AI. Um, again, I want you to vote on which ones do you think are the AI art and which do you think are a modern human artist uh, uh, showing their work at Basel. Um, so again, let's take a vote for um, the left-hand one. Who thinks that's AI art? Okay. So, uh, yes, quite a small number. Who thinks this one is the AI art? Um, so have I been messing with you, or do you think that, oh, he was clearly going to swap them over this time. Okay, so actually, you're right. Very well done. You, you voted for the, uh, this, the one on the right is the AI art. Um, but still, I think it, when these were shown to um, punters coming to Basel Art Fair, um, the, a lot of the response to the paintings that had been produced by this algorithm said they, found a, a, they had an emotional response to these ones. Um, what's interesting, the way these were produced, it wasn't just one algorithm. In fact, it was two algorithms competing against each other. One algorithm had, had learned on the styles of art of the past. And it was tasked with trying to break that style, create something new which can't be classified in, that in any kind of recognizable style. But it still must be art, so it shouldn't go completely beyond something that just makes us feel ill when we look at it. The second algorithm was tasked with discriminating. So it took the art and said, no, no, that's clearly still in the cubist style of um, art. Or else it said, no, you've gone too far. This is not art. Um, and the competition between them gradually uh, meant that the, the uh, creator algorithm started to learn from its kind of mistakes and started making art that was new, but that was still recognizable as art. This is called a creative adversarial network. And I think it's really how a lot of creativity works. Um, often you combine with somebody to, to, to make a project together, or as Paul Valéry, a uh, French poet, wrote, it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations, the other one chooses. Often that's what's happening in the brain, that kind of competition between the two. But for me, I think the most exciting thing about AI art is actually trying to understand the internal world of the algorithm. Because if these algorithms are changing, developing, and, and doing something new, quite often we don't know why they're making the decisions they are. And this becomes really important if they're making decisions about health or the legal profession. So some of the most exciting things have been taking a photograph and saying, well, what do you see in there, um, vision recognition algorithm? Uh, so here's a picture of a string quartet. I generally play on a Monday night, so I've given up my string quartet rehearsal to come and talk to you. And I asked this algorithm, it's called Deep Dream, what do you see inside here? Dial up the kind of mysterious things there. Um, when I did that, lots of animals appeared. Why? So my, our lead violinist turned into a kind of leopard. Um, the kind of bass section of the quartet turned into a car. Why? Because this is what it's learnt on. And by looking at its art, you can kind of understand how it's learnt. Um, and we find interesting things. Here's um, pictures of dumbbells that it started to see in some images, but it always saw a hand connected to the dumbbell. It never had seen a dumbbell on its own. It didn't realise that this, a dumbbell did not always come with an arm connected to it. But I think this is really important because... Um, the, the world of algorithms and AI and computing is, unfortunately, still very male-dominated. And this can cause a lot of bias in the kind of algorithms that are appearing. You think algorithms are kind of bias-free, they're neutral, they're mathematics. But no, if the data they've learned on is biased, the algorithm becomes biased. And so I think by looking at the art, you can see, for example, I did an event last year um, with a woman who is a roboticist at MIT, um, she's black, and when she was in front of the robot, the robot couldn't see her. When she put a white mask on, suddenly she was there. And it was understood that the, the vision recognition software had trained on a lot of white male faces. So this is about revealing what the internal world of the algorithm is actually doing. And for me, I think that's what art is about, partly. It's a distant early warning system that can always be relied on to tell the old culture, that's us, what is beginning to happen to it. But I think the most exciting thing 
is when this sort of thing is going to become conscious. When this phone starts going, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am, then we're really going to need to know, what is it doing? And I think the hard problem of consciousness, really understanding what you do, why do we create art? We create art to express our inner world. We write a novel to get you inside how I see the world. And so for me, I think AI art is something that could help us when, and I do believe when, AI becomes conscious, to feel like what it's like to be a machine. Because as Wittgenstein said, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand him. So perhaps the art that AI will produce is our way to kind of empathize with what it feels like to be a machine. Thank you.